Hello, and welcome to this meeting of the Barbados Genealogy Group. I welcome those of you who've joined us on Zoom, as well as those on Facebook Live. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Harriet Pierce, and I am the group's coordinator. Today, we welcome Ms. Anne-Marie Burns, who will speak on the topic, Island to Island, the provisioning plantation connection between Barbados and Shelter Island. Just to tell you a bit about the talk, in 1651, the four partners of Constant and Carmichael plantations in Barbados purchased an additional island on the east end of Long Island in New York. The 8,000 acre property was the first European settlement on the island's indigenous lands at the beginning of a family dynasty that lasted over 10 generations. As a provisioning plantation, it was a site of enslavement of transported Africans who we consider among the founders of the place called Shelter Island. Today, the nonprofit organization Sylvester Manor is dedicated to the telling the stories of all the people who lived, worked, and died on this land, and to researching their origins as best as we can back to Barbados and to Africa. Our speaker this evening, Donna Marie Barnes, began working at Sylvester Manor in 2014 after spending 30 years in the editorial photography field as a photo editor for Essence and People magazines and for the photo news agency's Gamma Liaison. She began as a volunteer docent at Sylvester Manor and in 2016 joined the staff full time as a curator and archivist. Her ongoing work now as Director of History and Heritage includes researching the lives and identities of the enslaved, free people of color, and indigenous people of Sylvester Manor at the east end of Long Island, and interpreting their stories into the manor's narrative and the larger history of the region. This work is an integral part of the organization's mission to preserve cultivate and share the stories of all the people of Sylvester Manor, restoring them to their place in history. But before we hear from Donna Maria, just to remind you to hold your questions until the end, then you have the option of typing your questions in the Q&A or using the raise hand feature, and we will allow you to ask your question on mic if you wish. Any comments you have, you can put those in the chat. <laughs> okay, so, right. So before much ado then, we will welcome Donna Marie to our forum. Donna Marie, it's up to you. <laughs> thank you so much, Harriet, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the Barbados Museum and Historical Society for inviting me to present today. I'm very honored to be here with you. My connection to Barbados is both a personal and professional one, as my maternal grandfather, Arnold Augustus Boyle, was born in Christchurch in 1889. His family moved to Guyana when he was a boy before he went to sea at age 14 as a merchant seaman. With my grandmother, who he met in Liverpool, England, they moved to New York City to raise a family as an interracial couple. My grandfather always considered Barbados home as my family and I continue to do today. So I'm very, very honored to be able to present this talk to you this afternoon. Professionally, my work at Sylvester Manor has, as Harriet indicated, origin connections to Barbados. And it is the place where much of our story and, and studies begin. And I will now attempt to share my screen. Okay, great. The land known as Shelter Island was the ancestral home of the indigenous Manhanset people who were part of the tribal system of the East End of Long Island. The Manhansets had made the island their home for millennia, living on the land, fishing, farming, and interacting with the familiar clans uh, in living in the region. The name Shelter Island is the English translation of the native name 
Manhansak Ahakwash Awamak, which means island sheltered by islands, as Shelter Island sits between the two forks of Long Island. In 1638, Long Island was bestowed to the Duke of Stirling by King Charles I of England in recognition for his services to the crown. In turn, the Duke had his man of business, James Farrett, select a, a location of his choice for himself. Farrett chose Shelter Island and nearby Robbins Island and sold them both soon afterwards to another New England merchant named Stephen Goodyear. None of these Englishmen ever visited the island. During the same period, as you know, sugarcane was introduced on Barbados as an alternate crop to tobacco whose growth had previously not done well. With the introduction of sugar to European markets, it soon proved to be the greatest cash crop of its time and the maker of fortunes on Barbados and throughout the Caribbean. The purchase and use of land of Barbados to build plantations, along with the transportation of enslaved Africans to do the arduous work, soon expanded across the island. And with the explosion of agricultural growth and the population, the needs and demands for provisions, foodstuffs, raw material, and livestock increased greatly. The economic connections between the Northeast United States and the colonies of the 17th century is not something that has been taught generally, nor is it part of the origin story of America. But from the very beginning, uh, the establishment, from the very beginning of the establishment of the settlement of colonies, cities, towns, and villages, the link was made and each prospered and depended on each other. Foodstuffs such as grains, smoked and preserved meat, livestock, and timber were shipped to the Caribbean in exchange for sugar, molasses, mahogany, and rum. Added to that was the exportation of enslaved Africans to the Northern colonies. This created the triangle trade of the Atlantic world and became the background of the history linking Barbados and Shelter Island. At the time of the Civil War in England, four English merchants who partnered in, in, in purchasing two plantations on Barbados, the Carmichael and Constant plantations decided to hedge their bets against being exiled from the island because of their parliamentarian leanings. <clears throat> they made a plan to purchase an alternate location somewhere in the Northeast where they already had business contacts. The partners were Thomas Middleton, Thomas Rausch, and the Anglo-Dutch brothers, Constant and Nathaniel Sylvester. The land they decided to purchase I don't know why this is not working. Um, purchase uh, for an alternate location was Shelter Island. Uh, they purchased it in 1651 from the New England businessman Stephen Goodyear, uh, the same home of the Manhansett people. The deal with Goodyear, including the 8,000 acres of Shelter Island, was 1,600 pounds of Muscovado sugar. The partner's plan was to build a substantial house that could serve as a refuge if they needed to bolt from Barbados and be their provisioning headquarters that would be worked by the enslaved Africans brought from Barbados. The enterprise was to be uh, overseen by the youngest partner, 30-year-old Nathaniel Sylvester. However, the indigenous people of the island had had enough exposure to Europeans, to Englishmen, to know that they had a legal recourse against the sale of the land against their will. The Manhansets, led by their sachem Yoko, sued the partners in a Connecticut court of law, stating that they had no part in the agreement and had not sanctioned the sale of their homeland. Incredibly, the Manhansets won their suit and the partners were forced to purchase the island a second time, this time paying the tribe 800 pounds of, of sugar and a quantity of cloth with the provision that the Manhansets would leave the island or work for the plantation. 
We refer to this first settlement as the provisioning plantation era, beginning with the supervision by Nathaniel Sylvester and his wife, Grizzle Brinley Sylvester. His descendants would go on to live and be landowners on Shelter Island for the next three centuries, over 11 generations on the property known as Sylvester Manor. The nonprofit organization, Sylvester Manor Educational Farm, was established in Shelter Island in 2009. And today, known simply as Sylvester Manor, comprises 237 acres of land, a Georgian style manor house built in 1737 by Nathaniel's grandson, outbuildings, and the continuation of a working farm. It remains the most intact plantation remnant north of Virginia. Our mission to preserve, cultivate, and share historic Sylvester Manor, telling the stories of all of the people who lived, worked, and died here, and sustaining the land for generations to come. In the talks that I've given and the, and the tours of the manor house uh, that I give, I've always talked about the connection, the historical connection between Barbados and Shelter Island. And this time though, giving this talk to you this afternoon, I'm especially excited about sharing our story and the work that we do. And I feel that this opportunity and the upcoming visit uh, to Barbados that my associate and I will be making next week um, is very different and very special for us. This is the first time I'm, I'm really addressing the connection specifically between our islands and speaking about the work we have embarked on to research and add to our story. This year, with funding from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we have been able to go deeper into the history and the research of the African people who were enslaved at Sylvester Manor and of the generations who continued to work, live, and die here as free people of color. But as we learn more and more information and identify new individuals to our narrative, I come back to the origins of the story and the questions surrounding the first Africans brought from Barbados to work on the provisioning plantation, who became the, the founding non-Indigenous ancestors of this land. As we tried to trace the African people who were brought not just to Sylvester Manor, but also to the general region, regions, the connections to the West Indies become stronger and more apparent. The questions become more relevant and the need to know who were they, where did they come from, how did they get here, becomes more important to us and to our narrative. From his arrival in 1651 to 1680 when he died, Nathaniel Sylvester grew from being the youngest partner of the plantation owners to establishing himself as the sole owner and lord of the manor on Shelter Island. From archeological studies done over the past 20 years by the University of Massachusetts in Boston, we know that the operation Nathaniel oversaw was a bustling commercial enterprise that cultivated the land for crops, harvested oak timber for barrel staves and raised livestock, all to be shipped on continuous voyages back to Barbados. For the most part, we are lacking in information and documentation on who the enslaved were or what skills they possessed that made them suited for the work that needed to be done on the island. Hints and signs can be found, however, in the landscape itself. None of the over 1 million artifacts uncovered points necessarily to Africans or slavery, but there are indications of the work that, are, that was done here long ago. A, a stone boulder wall from one end of the property to another indicates work that took tremendous strength and engineering. Likewise, a cobblestone driveway laid out in an intricate pattern shows skill and craftsmanship. Sewing needles, thimbles, and a variety of ceramics point to the work of women. These vestiges of the past tell a story and let us imagine the lives lived here. In his last will and testament, 
Nathaniel Sylvester listed 24 enslaved people living on the property. These individuals he listed according to family units, husbands and wives and their children who he bequeathed to his wife and their children. It is from this list that we get our first glimpse of who the enslaved people were. We know the names of these family units, but not how the couples were brought together. Were the men brought first uh, from Barbados, followed by the women and paired on Shelter Island? Or were men and women who were already coupled at one of the plantations pick, were, pick, were they picked to be transported in order that they could start families in the North? Whatever the circumstances, this diaspora brought them to a completely different foreign land with arduous work in a cold and hostile climate. And it is their survival, their resilience and fortitude that is, as, that is at the heart of the legacy of Sylvester Manor. And it's the reason that the Sylvester family thrived and endured through the centuries. Nathaniel and his wife Grizzle had 11 children. Yes, her name was Grizzle, it's very unfortunate. Had 11 children that survived to adulthood despite Grizzle's youth when they married. She was 16 years old when they wed and had recently been sent to New England by her father, Thomas Brinley, who had served as the Royal Auditor to King Charles. She was sent along with her siblings for safety at the start of the Civil War. She met Nathaniel and was wooed by him and, and accepted his proposal to be his wife and come to his island. A 16 year old girl from London who had grown up in the shadow of the Royal Court was not equipped for a life carved out of the wilderness far from her family and all she had known. As part of her dower, her brother Francis who had worked for a time as an agent in Barbados purchased three enslaved people of her own. Their names were Hannah, Jacaro, and their young daughter, Hope. We consider them to be the first non-native family of Shelter Island. They arrived from Barbados in 1653 with Grizzle and served her for the next 34 years. It was most likely Hannah's experience with pregnancy and childbirth that ensured that Grizzle safely delivered her babies and that they grew to adulthood. It was Hannah's skill in running a household that ensured that the Sylvester house functioned. We can only imagine the roles that Hannah played as there is no documentation of her life beyond her name listed on the will of Nathaniel in 1680 and in Grizzle Sylvester's will of 1687. But the fact of the family survival speaks to the importance of her presence and its contribution to the history of the place. Likewise, another couple listed in, six, in the 1680 will tells an important story. Tamaru and Oyo, we believe, were both born in Nigeria, Africa, and transported to Barbados and then to Shelter Island. Like the others, we don't know how they became a couple, but perhaps it was because of the commonality of their origins, a shared language perhaps, and shared culture. They would have four children born on Shelter Island, and today we are able to document three generations of their family, and we believe that there are descendants still today who can trace their origins back to Temro and Oyo. Following Nathaniel Sylvester's death, uh, Tamaro and Oyo's oldest son, Obium, were sold to settle a debt to a relative by marriage. Tamaro and Oyo themselves were also used to settle debts acquired by Nathaniel's sons before being brought back when the debt was finally settled. Nathaniel's children, specifically his sons, did not inherit their father's business sense and squandered their inheritance within a few years of their father's death. From documents and letters, we know that Obium lived for a time in Boston and in Newport, Rhode Island, before being settled out back on Long Island at a place called Lloyd's Manor, a family related to the Sylvester's through marriage. There he married an enslaved woman named Rose, and they had several, several children 
the eldest of which was called Jupiter. Jupiter took the last name of Haman and like his father had been taught to read and write by the Lloyds. He would go on to become the first published African-American poet in the United States. One of his most famous poems is entitled An Essay on Slavery and it begins, our forefathers came from Africa, tossed o'er the raging main to a Christian shore, therefore to stay and not return again. Although these lines in the general history describe the general history of enslavement and the transportation of Africans across the Middle Passage, they also reflect the lives and experience of Jupiter's grandparents, Tamaro and Oyo. We wonder, did he grow up hearing the stories from his father that had been told to him of the voyage across the ocean to a foreign land with a foreign god? Were other traditions and remembrances also passed down? Did Oyo, his grandmother, bring with her the tradition of ceramics made by African women and use that knowledge to make the most significant of the ar archeological artifacts found at Sylvester Manor, the artifact that we refer to as the pot. When this pot was analyzed by the archeologists, they found that the design on it is a traditional Native American design found on other pottery from Long Island, but that the clay was mixed with shell and fired, which was not a Native tradition. Likewise, the pot has the presence of a handle, which was neither native nor African. It's a European device. Did Oeo create this pot to reflect the life she was leading on Sylvester Manor, exposed to native indigenous women and working for a white English woman? We may never know the answers to these questions, but the evidence that remain traces their existence here and we honor them and their memory. Beyond the names uh, listed on the last wills and testaments and in account books, we have no information on who the enslaved were who were brought to Sylvester Manor and to Shelter Island from the Caribbean. But as we research and find more and more information on the generations that came after the original 24 individuals, I have felt that the beginning of the story is still an important link to what and who came afterwards. And our questions continue. Are there still records that exist, possibly on Barbados, that hold the keys to this knowledge? Or is this an instance where we truly have to say, nothing more can be known at this time? For myself, I'm not ready to concede that quite yet. We feel today that we owe it to these ancestors to try very hard to look wherever possible to uncover their stories and hope that they are ready to be revealed. As in genealogy work, uh, sometimes the story hits a brick wall, a wall that has been impossible to break through until one day, one day a crack shows and you find a document, you find a reference, you see a name. And through that crack, a ton of new information flows at last. Over the last nine months, the research we have been doing at Sylvester Manor has given us such breakthroughs, and we have been able to tell a more complete story of the lives and the descendants of many of the enslaved people. With the funding we have received for our research, we have been able to widen our scope and to spend more time devoted to uncovering and previously unknown facts and identities of several individuals who played significant roles in our history. The majority of these individuals, we believe, are buried at Sylvester Manor at a place we call the Afro-Indigenous Burial Ground. With ground penetrating radar, it has been revealed that up to 200 people are possibly laid to rest here in unmarked graves. Using documents such as account books, letters, church records, we've been able to identify the enslaved and free people of color, as well as several native people who are buried in this space. For the next two years, additional archeological work with UMass Boston and in partnership with the Shinnecock Indian Nation will be done in the burial ground to learn more than we already know. 
Although we don't know the placements of their graves, we do know that Hannah, Jacaro, and Hope, and the others are most likely laid to rest here. The story of the Sylvester family on Barbados begins in the 1640s when the father of Nathaniel and Constance Sylvester, Giles Sylvester, started to do trade with Barbados selling and transporting their goods. Giles was an English businessman who lived in Amsterdam in the, ne in the Netherlands. Following his death, his son Constance moved from, from Amsterdam to Barbados in 1646, purchasing the Constant and Carmichael plantations in St. George Parish in partnership with Thomas Rausch and Thomas Middleton. His younger brother, Nathaniel, after spending years traveling and working on his father's ship, also traveled to Barbados. And from there, the plan to establish a provisioning plantation on Shelter Island was born. Constance married Grace Waldred, the daughter of Humphrey Waldred, a major plantation planter. And in 1661, they left Barbados to return to England to live. Constant died in Brampton, England in 1671, leaving his widow Grace, his properties in Barbados, making her the wealthiest woman on the island and the largest slaveholder at the time. Throughout the generations, the Sylvester descendants have told the story of the connection between Barbados and Shelter Island. Visits have been made by family members during the 19th and 20th centuries as evidenced by descriptions and photos that remain within our collections in the Manor House. And now, as we embark on new phases of our research, we are preparing to visit again in order to look and hopefully to find vestiges of this history, of the lives and the circumstances of the African people who were brought to Shelter Island against their will from another island that was not their homeland. They survived all of this and made a life whose legacy we strive to honor today. This is only the beginning. Again, I'd like to thank you so much for having me this afternoon, and I look forward to, have, to continuing this conversation both here this afternoon and when we visit Barbados uh, just coming up in 10 days. Thank you again so much. Thank you so much, Donna Marie. That was fascinating. Uh, leaving that connection between Barbados, Shelter Island, Amsterdam, you know, it has been wonderful. And I am sure there are persons out there who would like to make a comment or ask a question. So we are going to open the floor now. If you're interested in asking a question, you can use the Q&A or you can use the raise hand feature and we will allow you, if you wish, to ask your question on mic. We have someone here, right? This is Hillary and Pat who is thanking you. Uh, fantastically interesting. Thank you. Okay. All right. For until other persons um, contribute, I just want to let you know that in the journal of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society for 1998, there's actually an article disturbing the peace in Barbados, Constant Sylvester of Constant Plantation in the 17th century. He was charged with disturbing the peace. So let me hear um, disturbing the peace is not uh, uh, just a current thing. <laughs> he started of disturbing the peace in the 1650s, right? So you can actually learn more about him from this article in our journal. Let's see if there's another question. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any more um, questions so far. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add, uh, Donna Marie? Um just that we are uh, very interested in making these connections. Um, we hope to try to establish and, or just to investigate whether or not there are records still on Barbados that we can, we can find. We, we speak often um, and there is documented evidence that 
the transportation back and forth between Shelter Island and Barbados was a constant thing. They were sending provisions back. They were bringing goods uh, from Barbados to Shelter Island and the Northeast. And so we are very curious to see whether or not there are uh, ships manifest or whether there are records of these voyages mm -hmm. that might then also list the transportation of the enslaved people uh, going back and forth, not just to shelter to Sylvester Manor, but to um, the area of Eastern Long Island itself. Mm -hmm. Digging into this history of, of what we, I suppose we call it Northern slavery, which is not a, something that has been widely discussed or taught in the schools uh, historically. Um, Sylvester Manor, in collaboration with several other historical sites on Eastern Long Island and throughout New York, are engaged with retelling the story of going through our archives to, to find the evidence of this other story that was there, as we say, in plain sight, but not told. Uh, and more and more we find that there are connections between the east end of Long Island, the different towns and communities, um, and economic ties to the Caribbean and specifically to Barbados. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, and as I mentioned, when you're talking about um, finding new records, as I mentioned earlier, when we were speaking, I did come across a document in our collection, the minutes of the Legislative Council for the period like the 1660s, which in when Constant Sylvester was a member. So you may be able to glean something, at least his thinking and so yeah. on there. Okay, we have someone who wants to know if provisioning plantation, if the term provisioning plantation is common. Um yes, it, it well, it's the way that we have always described. Uh, the history at Sylvester Manor as a provisioning plantation. Um, other sites in New York uh, that I work with have also started to use that, that term. So uh, I suppose historically and academically, it is a, a term that um, is used to describe this relationship between the North, the Northeast and the Caribbean. Um, I don't know whether you're aware, but large farm establishments in the North, specifically in New York, are sometimes referred to as manors. Like Sylvester, is, property is called Sylvester Manor. There's a Lloyd's Manor, there's Floyd's Manor, there's Van Cortland Manor. Um, the term manor in the North refers to a property that was a plantation. Plantation as a term is usually applied to uh, land ownership in the South. And you don't think of plantations as being in the North. But during the early Dutch era of New York, uh, followed by the English era of New York, large farms were in fact functioning as plantations. And more times than not, they were being worked by enslaved African people. And so the term provisioning plantation describes not only what the place was, a farm uh, that was being worked by enslaved people, but the fact that the, the way the, uh, the economic driver of it was to provision the, the Caribbean plantations and sites as well. Thank you. We have another question here from Maggie B. Um, she said, very interesting talk shedding light on the name behind Constant Plantation. Would you say that the provisioning between Barbados and Shelter Island was a family arrangement? Um, that's a great question. So originally, as I said, the, the partnership of these four planters, of four merchants, Thomas Roush, Thomas Middleton, Constant and Nathaniel Sylvester, um, eventually Nathaniel, he was a very good businessman. He was a wheeler dealer kind of guy. Um, and because the, the Sylvester brothers had this relationship of being raised in Amsterdam, they, were, they very easily went back and forth between being Dutch and being English. And uh, the politics in New York at that time, um, the mid 17th century, uh, was still going back and forth between the Dutch uh, claiming New York and then the English naming New York. And so during a period where the Dutch came back into power, Nathaniel 
uh, being the only partner that was uh, in residence in New York, swore his allegiance to the Dutch in a kind of, I'm, I've, I've, I'm Dutch, I was born in Amsterdam, I've always been Dutch, I've, I'll always be Dutch. And the, the agreement that he came up with with them, um, with the Dutch representatives, was that because the other partners were not on site, and because Nathaniel was paying allegiance to them, they said to him, well, you can buy them out sort of in absentia. You give us 500 pounds and we will name you the Lord of the Manor. And he said, I'll do that. And so therefore he, he finagled a way to be the sole owner of the property. Likewise, when the English came back into power, he swore allegiance to the English but I'm an Englishman, I've always been an Englishman. Um, and they upheld his, his sovereignty as being the Lord of the Manor. He did have to make financial restitutions to the other partners. Okay, thanks for that. He seemed to have been a bit of an opportunist. Yes, a bit yes. of an opportunist. Yes, we have Glenn Husbands who would raise his hand. Sorry, we kept you so long, Glenn. Uh, do you still wish to make a submission? Um, yes, yes, thanks. And I hope you can hear me. Very interesting yes. talk. Um, actually, one of my questions got answered because I was curious about the provision and I've never heard that term applied to a plantation mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm curious about the actual Sylvester Manor now. Is it still owned by the Sylvester family or is it the public or what's what, what's the situation? That's a, that's, a, that's a great question. So up until 2006, it was a family residence. Um, the last uh, heir, actually the wife of the last heir, the 10th generation heir died in 2006. Um, and she and her husband, Andrew Fisk, who was the 10th generation heir, had lived there for over 50 years. So up until that time, it was a private place. Um, they were very aware of their history, but they did not invite the public in. Uh, the 11th generation heir knew that he would never live there and wanted to preserve not only the land and the house, but the legacy. And so he created a not-for-profit organization, which is how we function today. And so the property is open to the public. Uh, the manor house that was built in 1737, which is the second house on the site, um, has not been open to the public these last two years because of COVID. We are slowly coming back and opening up. And so I haven't been giving house tours, but I've been giving history, walking tours, tours around the property, uh, telling some of the stories and more uh, of what I've told you today. today. Thank you. Um, Glenn, does that answer your question? Do you have any follow-up? Um, no, that, that, that um, no, I'm just curious. I was just curious, given the debate that's happening in Barbados with the um, with Drax, Drax Hall. I was just curious. Uh, Yes, yes. Okay, okay, understood. Okay, we have um, something from Systems for Peace. And uh, person said, I'm curious to know what degree you're in. I'm not, if you find evidence that, oh, the best you want to know if you found evidence that the enslaved were able to write, if they were literate. If they were literate. Hmm. Uh, uh, mm, that's a good question too. Um, the original 24 people, uh, enslaved people listed on Nathaniel's will, we have very little documentation of them except for their names. And so our assumption is that they were not literate. Um, going into the 19th century, late 18th century, uh, we do see evidence that uh, enslaved people were taught to read or write. Um, and then going uh, from slavery to freedom, um, post-American Revolution on the east end of Long Island saw a, a vast increase in manumissions and emancipations of enslaved people, uh, moving them from enslavement to freedom. That was both a because of shifting moral values and also economic situations after the revolution. So there is evidence uh, going into the 19th century that people of color were literate. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think this person wanted to know if there was a practice. Um, did you find a practice to educate, to transfer that type of skill to the enslaved? 
of reading and writing? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. No, we haven't found any evidence of, of any practice. We have found evidence of uh, uh, children of color being enrolled on the Shelter Island School. We have we have found that. Um, and other instances where we find signatures of uh, either formerly enslaved people now living as free people and uh, building lives on Shelter Island. Okay, so we have um, a question from Marcia Nurse. She wants to find out if the Sylvester family um, practiced Jew, the Jewish religion, if they were considered Jews in Amsterdam. No, they weren't. They weren't Jewish. They were what was referred to as Anabaptists. Mm -hmm. um, Nathaniel and uh, his wife Grizzle um, were either either became or were very sympathetic to the Quaker religion. Mm -hmm. They hosted uh, the founder of the Quakers, William Fox, um, at Sylvester Manor, and he wrote in his diary how he had, before voyage, actually to Barbados, where he came to Barbados to preach, that he had visited uh, uh, Sylvester's Island, as he referred to it, and had preached in Madame Sylvester's dooryard to a, a group of Native people, uh, Native Americans, and to enslaved Africans. Thank you very much. Um, just checking to see if I've missed any more. Any there's, other... a, uh, there's a raised hand. And... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, Alessandra, you have the mic. Hi, good afternoon and um, a special welcome to Donna Marie. Thank you Thank very you. much for giving us this fascinating talk and I'm so pleased that you're with us now and, and will be joining us later on this month. Um, your, your presentation uh, raised several interesting questions. Um, but for example, what you just responded to there raises one point. Um, might the visit of William Fox to the, the Sylvester's encouraged their thinking about going to Barbados in the first place to, to extend their business relations. Um, we don't know of what the encouragement might have been otherwise, but uh, perhaps they were already thinking of that. Um, but it would be an interesting connection to make since he also visited Barbados and right. was influential there. Okay. Uh, I I was going to ask one or two other points, but if you want to answer, go ahead. Sure. Um, actually, I have to correct myself. It's George Fox, not William Fox. Not William Fox, right. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if I understand you. Were you thinking that his, his exposure to the Sylvester's prompted him to go to Barbados no. or the other way around? The other way around. Well, no, because when he visited them on Shelter Island, the connection to Barbados was already established. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the, the second question I have is the pottery that you show that you in, illustrated had both um, features of, of Native American, African, and uh, European. You mentioned these together in uh, in a pot. Do you know approximately the date of the production of that piece? Um, uh, and um, have you been looking at similar pieces in other plantation settings uh, in that part of, of uh, the United States? Um, we don't have, well, there's no way to uh, specifically date it. However, the archaeologists do date it in what we refer to as the plantation era. So mm -hmm. from 1651 to uh, 1698, basically. Okay. All right. Uh, so it's a fairly early piece. All it's right. a fairly early piece. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it was found near what they refer to as a trash heap. Um, and it was it was very much intact the way that it is in the photograph. That's how it sort of came out of the ground. Um, 
we haven't really looked at other pieces, although I did see something actually just by chance online the other day made by um, um, a, a Native people in Connecticut uh, from the Pequot tribe, uh, a similarly shaped pot with the design at the top and then sort of a, a bowl at the bottom, but without a handle. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a third question, but I can't remember it offhand, so I'll retire. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Feel Good to free see to you. come back and then you remember. Yes. For um, Anne Marie, I know lots of Barbadians come down to New York for holiday and so on. How easy is it to get to Shelter Island? Um, <laughs> I think I think <laughs> Alessandra can, can answer that because she recently came to visit us and it was quite a journey. <laughs> that it was a voyage. <laughs> Voyage of discovery, yes, I had no idea of the intricacies. So mm. it's not easy, but it's not impossible. It's it can not, and yes. it can be done in a day. So yeah. Yes. If you were if you were coming to New York it. City, it's uh, about three hours from New York City. Um, to get to the island, you must take a ferry. There are two ferries on the north or the south side. They run continuously. Um, if you were coming from New England, you would take the ferry from New London, which is about uh, a two-hour trip. Um, so it, it's it's not immediate, but it's not impossible. And if anyone is coming to New York and would like to come and visit uh, us next season, next from the spring to to about now, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Sure, thank you. So you're saying you actually take the ferry from New York? No, you take Wait. the you take the ferry from. So as I said, uh, Shelter <laughs> Island is in between the two yeah. forks, yeah, right. and so you would take a ferry either from the North Fork or from the South Fork. Okay, so you take the Long Island, you work Long Island Railway, to yes, the North, and then the the ferry. Yes. Okay. Oh. yes, or or a bus, or a or car. the bus, or a car. <laughs> All right, but so for fly in to Shelter Island. <laughs> no, you can't fly, no. Okay, so those of you then who are interested, um, you can add Shelter Island to your list of places to go. Okay, let's, we have some, someone from um, Facebook, Dorian from Facebook wants to know if there was any intermarriage between the Native Americans and the enslaved Africans? Yes, there was. Um, not, we don't know for certain, we don't have uh, documented proof during that early era. We do know that um, as African people moved from slavery to freedom, as I said, in the late uh, 18th, early 19th century, they did begin to more and more intermarry with the native people. Um, the Shinnecock tribe that I mentioned who live in Southampton um, are generally a, a mixed tribe of, with ancestry from Africa and uh, from indigenous ancestors. And you find that throughout the Eastern Long Island tribes. Okay, all right. We have another um, question from Systems for Peace. Person asked, have there been further examinations of the ships that were used in the transportation of these enslaved persons to establish if they were involved in other shipments? Ah, well, no, the answer to that is not yet. Um, this is sort of an ongoing investigation. And, and as I said, part of the reason for the trip to Barbados to do some research or to start to ask these questions, um, one at the archive, the National Archive in Barbados and at the university uh, where we hope we are gonna be meeting with uh, history professors there um, in, a, in a hope that we can uh, establish partnerships and collaborations between the university and the studies that we do at, at Sylvester Manor to, foster a hope that students will be interested in finding these connections and to doing research into this specific diaspora. 
that would include hopefully researching and finding records, ships, manifest records, uh, listings of, of, of transportation, of sale possibly. Um, we find evidence in records that we have here on the East End, both at on Shelter Island and the surrounding areas of ships coming from the Caribbean and from Barbados with the transportation of people. Um, and there'll be, maybe be like notations of um, Negro child bought uh, at the dock in Sag Harbor or in Greenport uh, from a ship that came from, from Barbados. Um, and so from, those, from that little bit of, of evidence, we feel that there could be additional records. We hope that there are um, that will expand the story and really sort of uh, fill out what we feel was a continuous economic um, connection and relationship between our part of the Northeast and, and Barbados. Thank you. Just to add a bit to that for Systems for Peace, if you're interested in slave voyages, there is an ongoing project, um, Professor Eltis is the principal on that, looking at the voyages of slave ships. And there's actually a website, Slave Voyages. So perhaps you may want to check that website to yeah. see if there is any indication of ships arriving at Shelter Island, what, you know, uh, if there's any connection. Yes. So that is Slave Voyages. So just have a look at that website. Thank you. I think there's another question. Uh, let's. Okay, um, Maggie B wants to know what will be your focus of research when you visit Barbados. I think you have mentioned um, some of that, but if you want to expand for sure. benefit. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> As I said, part of our research will be to uh, look for uh, references to Constant Sylvester, the Constant Plantation, also whether there were account books for the plantation uh, from 1650, 1651 to 53, whatever, to see whether any of the names that we find on Nathaniel's 1680 will show up uh, in reference to the Constant or Carmichael plantations, as well as the ship's manifest. We're also, again, just trying to make relationships. This part of our uh, expanding our narrative and our research into this connection is something that we've just really started to dive into this year. And so having this connection to the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, to professors at the university, to the archive, is just the first step in, in building this relationship. So we hope that this is actually the first visit um, and certainly not the last. Thank you. We look forward to hosting you here at the museum. Okay, I think I have exhausted the comment. Alexandra's hand is up again. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, thank you very much. I um, remember my third question from there, and one or two others that I wanted to raise for Donna Marie. Uh, Donna Marie, you specifically referenced Jupiter Hammonds as the first published black poet in the United States, correct? Yes. Can you give us a little more, bit more detail? What, how have you established that he's the first? When was he the first? And okay. what distinguishes his work? Mm. Um, and, and then I'll ask the others. Okay. Um, uh, one, you put me a little bit on the spot as I don't have the date completely at <laughs> hand, but I believe that his poem was published in a newspaper in 1796. He was friendly with Phyllis Wheatley, who was uh, also an African-American poet. Um, Jupiter, when he published his poem, was an, old, an elderly man. Um, uh, and he published before she, she had a, had a book of poetry published, and again, I, I don't know the date offhand at the moment, but his appeared before her book was published um, and his was serialized in a newspaper. 
Um, we do know we have actually a lot of documentation about Jupiter Hammond um, at Lloyd's Manor, which, as I mentioned, was a uh, another plantation manor um, uh, on Long Island, about 60 miles from Shelter Island, and that they were connected to the Sylvester's through marriage. Um, the documentation about Jupiter um, that he was taught to read and write by uh, the members of the Lloyd family. He was a devout Christian who used uh, his Christianity throughout his poetry. Um, uh, my associate Alice has just texted me to say that he published in 16, 17, 1761. Thank you, Alice, as always. Um, he took the name Hammond, and, and we don't completely know why. Um, he was not married. He was enslaved all of his life. And he encouraged uh, other enslaved Black people to read and write. He, he In one of his addresses, um, he said, um, to endure your fate, but to learn to read and write the Bible so that you may be comforted by the knowledge of the Lord. He used his Christianity as sort of a cover to uh, encourage other Black people to learn to become literate, because not only could you read your Bible, which would keep you uh, holy or religious, as it were, but it would also enable you to be independent, even within your enslavement. Um, okay. He is buried at Lloyd's Manor. Uh, again, as I said, he had no children and he remained enslaved all of his life. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And um, I, I'm, I'm very relieved that Alice gave you that information because <laughs> for this weekly was 1793, so mm -hmm. I believe. Anyway, uh, so. Uh, very interesting to know about Jupiter. Um, I think that my final question is more about the burial ground um, because you know the location of the burial ground, you know the likelihood of at least 200 burials having taken place in there through um, scientific mm -hmm. research. Um, so is it that there is and I, I and I assume through oral testimony as well, indicating that this was a place of burial on the island. So are we not seeing anything in the written record of the, the property to indicate that burials were being done there? Um, surely, uh, if not for the importance of the event, then for the indication of expense unless it was left solely to the enslaved and the indigenous to to bury their their own people and mm -hmm. on that front uh you know it was the precedence given to either or both or or it i mean in terms of time frame yeah you know when certain things happened were, were the indigenous buried first and then as the enslaved came to the island were they put the place in the same place yeah yeah and then i have a comment after Thank okay you. sure so what we know of the burial ground uh and what we believe uh the family has always referred to this area as the burial ground um, and the stone that they placed there in the late eight, 19th century calls it the burial ground of the colored people, which is how the family referred to it. Um, so they have always acknowledged that this is, this is that area. There are, as I said, unmarked graves, but they are marked with field stones, a head and a foot stone. Part of the investigation that we're doing in this project now with the in, in collaboration with the University of Massachusetts and with the Shinnecock Nation in Southampton is the belief that this was a, an ancestral burial ground originally, that this was a, a, a burial ground for native people. How far back that goes, we don't know. Part of the investigation at present uh, going forward, probably in the spring, we'll do more ground penetrating radar, is to see whether the burial ground extends beyond the borders that the family made by outlining it with a, an old picket fence 
uh, whether it does in fact cross the driveway into another wooded area, whether it's, it's bigger than we um, suspect it to be. And if that's so, then we believe that those graves, if we find them, would probably be much older and therefore probably native graves. Um, moving from the, into the 18th century, into the 19th century, the documentation of burials becomes greater. And it's part of what we've been able to uncover this year. We've looked at the, the cemeteries for the rest of Shelter Island, uh, the Presbyterian, the Catholic, a uh, Methodist, um, and there are no other, there are no listings of uh, people of color in those cemeteries, which leads us to assume then that those people were still interred at Sylvester Manor. We have found notations in account books and in letters between family members of enslaved people dying at the manor, listing them by name and the circumstances of their death, and the fact that they were buried in the burial ground. We even have notations of who dug the graves, where they bought the, the, the coffins from. And so that has really aided us in being able to identify who in fact were, be were buried there, uh, when they might have died. And in, in that way, we are able to then, even though we don't have a list of who's buried where or uh, tombstones, we have been able to reestablish um, the identities of the people laid to rest and to divide them with, um, as we said, with uh, obituaries, as it were, or biographies of, of their lives uh, on Shelter Island as enslaved and or free people of color and their descendants. Um, the last person that we know that was buried there died in 1908. Hmm. Okay. And we okay. consider Julia Havens Johnson to be the last person last. buried yeah. there. Ironically, she was, she was if close to, if not a hundred years old. Um, we know from a letter that she was that she died in nearby village of Sag Harbor, brought back across the water to Shelter Island, as was her request to be buried at Sylvester Manor with her family members, her mother and her stepfather and her sister, and and her uh, a, a, an unnamed child. She was close to a hundred years old. This mm. was 1908, and they still did not mark her grave. Wow. Yeah. Um, incidentally, another marker of Barbadian ancestry is longevity, and we are used to centenarians, a lot of centenarians. Yes. So you never know. Um, my final point is more, uh, well, more two comments based on the, the questions raised today. And I want to, to note that um, the question on intermarriage between Native Americans and enslaved Africans, I think uh, one of the important points that we need to, to um, uh, recognize is that in the 17th century, um, uh, the Barbados legislature was also dealing with issues of um, bringing in Native Americans, both from South America and from North America. Mm -hmm. into Barbados to help with the establishment of plantation properties. And that although it was not systematic and it didn't last forever, there is evidence of that and evidence yeah. also of the indigenous and the enslaved um, generating relationships and families. I think what maybe very interesting for us is understanding the continuity of that practice through, for example, those enslaved Africans who removed themselves from Barbados by escaping to St. Vincent and other islands where they joined Amerindian mm. um, communities and became what were known as the um, yeah. Black Caribs, for example. and 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 further on over uh, in rural town and other locations. So there's a long um, history, which has not really been well established and understood of the interrelationships between Native Americans and 
Africans because it's not just enslaved but also. Yeah. So I want to mention that as an interesting point that should bears closer yes. about. And then secondly, on the point of the term provisioning, Shelter Island is not the first time I've heard that term. And I think it, it does bear closer examination that these properties, particularly in the North, if mm -hmm. not, partly in the South, where they were established by not just Barbadians, but West Indians at that very early phase was not because they thought that these were profit-making properties to be, but specifically because they were intended to provision Barbados, Antigua and other um, uh, properties in the Caribbean, which is where they expected to make their money. And so that term provisioning was first mm -hmm. used to me by um, someone who was investigating, I can't remember the name of the property, but a property in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So down the seaboard is where I, I think again, because the tendency is that we examine one place right, and, and have one interlink, we are not seeing the, the, the spread of the practice and understanding the interconnections that started in the 17th century and continued pretty much down in some instances down to the 20th, yes. um, but definitely into the, into the 19th, you know? So I think it is, it is a methodology and approach that deserves more yes. investigation and analysis, so yeah. Absolutely, and and that is a very succinct way of of saying what it is that we're trying to start to do with 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 these new partnerships and collaborations to be able to have more conversations about these connections and about the history, and on both sides, mm -hmm. uh, to to give this information to your audiences and to then enrich and enlarge our narratives for our audiences. So mm -hmm. I think we have lots of work to do and lots of visits to make yeah and lots of programming to conceive together that yeah. i'm really looking forward to mm -hmm. Same thank, here. You so, thank you so much yeah um to follow up on what alessandra said i just want to point to one item we have in our collection which is the pele sanford letters he mm. was a ship's captain from Rhode Island, who eventually became the governor of Rhode Island. And his brother operated in Barbados, had a business in Barbados, and Sanford would be the person bringing the, um, he's a, he was captaining the ship, bringing cod, horses, different provisions from Rhode Island to Barbados and taking provisions from Barbados to Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And that just shows the kind of business relationships that grew up where Barbados was at the center of that Atlantic economy. And you had ship owners, persons with, with businesses here, some with the business in Rhode Island or along that, that seaboard and that connect, that commercial connection. Okay, I don't think we have any other questions or comments. So I want to thank you, Donna Marie, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Really, yes, it has really shown that, that connection, that family, that commercial connection between Barbados, the USA, the Northern part of the USA, because normally when you talk about Barbados and the US, you talk about the Carolina collection. Yes. Yes, but that showed that connection and also with Europe. So thank you so very much for the presentation. I want to, to thank all the persons who asked questions or made comments. Thank you all so much for participating. And Donna Marie, we look forward to hosting you next week. Thank you so much. I thank you again to everybody for joining us this afternoon and to listening to this talk. Thank you. 
So I just want to remind persons that our next call is scheduled for December 1st. We're going to be um, about two weeks, normally they are the third Thursday. We're going to um, deviate from that a bit. So it's going to be the 1st of December and we're going to also deviate from our theme, theme of, of connections, geographical family connections. We, Marcia Nurse, a member of our group, is going to be sharing some of her family research. So we look forward to seeing um, and hearing Marcia on December 1st. So again, I want to thank you, Donna Marie. Thank you for all, to all the persons who participated and I wish you all well. Have a good evening and be safe. Bye. And of course, we want to thank Elena who has kept us technically sound. Bye everyone.